you guys have any questions for Laura, hi. Can you hear hi. me? Yay. Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I have my phone. It's really weird. Um, I wanted to have it be freehand, so I have all this tape. It's not very um, sturdy right now. And there's like washi tape and erasers, like wedged. So, <laughs> but how are you? <laughs> I put see. mine on a tripod. <laughs> That's a lot more practical. That's smarter. <laughs> and my rainbow light makes me really like pink, but I kind of like it. But anyway, it's good to see I have you. A, a, a a light on my desk that got like a blue covering on it and oh, <laughs> i turned it on oh i'm blue that's super cool i <laughs> like it I have a halo. yeah well i have some people who have already sent some questions which is cool um but anyone that's watching um and i'll i'll reiterate if people join but of course if people think of something they can type it there's a little question like icon that's really handy, and that way I won't miss anything either. But, and if you see something, you can of course answer. But I wanted to ask you, I, this is not an art question, but I love seeing what you make and what you cook. You're an amazing cook. So what did you eat for dinner tonight? <laughs> I'm sure it was better than mine. <laughs> um, okay. I had, I, we made, I made soup. I made a big pot of soup. Ew. What kind of soup was it? Um, it's got lentils and celery and onions and garlic and, uh, yeah. oh, and I had some dried, uh, squash from our garden from last year and That's... I dumped all, a bunch of that in. Uh, some frozen broccoli, okay. some canned tomatoes. Yeah. potatoes it was kind of like what all needs to be used you know <laughs> yeah and i feel like veggies they go so well together in so many combinations so cool and Pretty you much, do yeah. i think you do like a like you have a container garden i've seen have you done that like a lot before yeah, yeah i started that this year because uh, we moved in september really abruptly like we moved our, our house in about a two week period of time. Yeah. Like wow. completely moved. Um, and I left behind a garden, which yeah. was really sad. Yeah. And um, I hadn't planned on starting a new one because we're not really sure how long we're going to live in this house. But then I was like, I should probably have a garden right now. Yeah. And so we did. We got a bunch of five, five gallon buckets and did some soil mixture in it. And um, yeah, we've got lettuce and kale and now um, tomatoes and wow. broccoli and beet That's and so next cool. week i'm going to be planting squash <laughs> That's so cool it can be done it can be yeah that's so cool well, awesome well i wanted to ask you so well, what kind of openness and we talked about it throughout but i opened with taylor talking about being an artist um, and as far as what's happening now and what it's like to be an artist, even if you already work from home or I guess a lot of us that live here have studios that are either in our house or your, close your to question, our house. Your question is cutting out. It's cutting okay. out and I'm not, I, was, I couldn't hear all of your question. Okay. Um, so the, I, I wanted to ask about um, being an artist um, with what's happening right now. And as far as, um, has, have there basically been any changes to like your art practice or have you been doing other things um, that's maybe creative in a different way as far as with everything that's happening and like your response to it, this is how you feel. Because I feel like a lot of artists either aren't creating as much or maybe it's the opposite. Taylor's making these portraits, responding to people who are isolated and sending her these selfies. And so what's been different for you or how has it been for you? The main thing that's been different for me is the fact that I just came off of getting ready for a show and had my opening at the very beginning of March. And um, so I was pretty burnt out 
from getting ready for that. I literally finished that piece. Yeah. The day of my show. And, and you said <laughs> like, you, you've worked on it for like almost a year for that show. I remember reading your post. Uh, yeah, I started on it. I actually started on it um, right at the beginning of my show at Tipton Gallery last year. So that was okay. in um, the of June, it's the beginning of March. Okay. Wow. That's so, and so how soon after, well, you said the beginning of March was your reception of this past March. And then I guess it was up for, or it's still up at the, uh, where it's being presented or, okay. Gosh. So how yeah, is it been? Everything is, still, everything is still there. Like my walls are all empty. <laughs> right. That has to be so surreal. And what Am was I the original? Am I coming through for you? Because you're, you, for me, you're glitching. <laughs> okay. There's been a and couple of glitches. There's been a little bit. I can do like a, I can do like a thumbs up or something if it's glitching again. But right now, it's, it seems to be good. Okay. Um, well, you had, you had asked uh, what I'm doing right now and as far as like what's different. I had originally just been kind of giving myself permission to do nothing but I still felt like I wanted to do something. And so I, I started making like these little knotted turtles. <laughs> yeah. And so I have, <laughs> I've been making them. I will move this hair. Um, They're super so cool. I've been making, <laughs> They're so I've been making cool. these little turtles. <laughs> what? They're I super, love some them. of them are really tiny. You can see how tiny that is. Yes. Um, so, and I've made some rings. But I, I finally started working on the new piece that is that I'm going to be giving myself a year to do. Okay. Um, wow. It's quite long. <laughs> this is a yeah. lot of the string that I just kind of wrapped around. Um, this is about, I'm going to say it's about four or five feet long, this section. And I usually start with a circle, but I didn't. And I'm kind of like, okay. see, I don't know if you can see that on the sketch right here, but it's it's going to be sort of shaped like that. Yeah, I can see that like is. the curve, the curvature of but, it. Um, <laughs> but really that cool is what I've been out. It's so yeah. what? It's cool to see um, like your notes and like just like how it, the beginnings oh. <laughs> of it. And yeah, that was a question you know that was thing about <laughs> Sorry, it's hard. I, I'm no, already having a hard time telling. Um, the thing about uh, doing work that takes so long is that sometimes I will do a sketch, and then I won't actually get to start on it for a really, really long time. So this sketch I've actually had since I was working on the other piece last year, and I've been really anxious to get started on it. <laughs> but you know, and then sometimes I will be looking through my sketchbook and I will see something and I won't even really remember. It was so long ago. I won't remember what the like the inspiration was um, right. and the drawing won't necessarily give me enough information. And so I'm just like, well, I guess that idea is gone. Right. But um, yeah, so I don't always do a sketch, though. So. Yeah, and that was a question that was set in is and I'm, I'm sure a lot of artists can relate to this, but um, how do your projects or what are some of the different examples of how they begin? Because um, sometimes they're sketches, but I'm sure there's many other ways too. So what is your like beginning process like? And do you do um, any type of research or oh, I'm starting to glitch a little bit. Let's see. Yes, let's see. Okay. There we go. Okay, is it am I clear now? <laughs> yes, you are. Um, so uh, the question was just, um, what are the different examples of how you get started? And how do you choose um, what process you use to begin with, with how you begin a new piece? Um, that's a good question. Because <laughs> a lot of times I like to start with a spiral because um, many of my pieces, if I don't, I wish I had something to like show. Oh, I do on the wall. Okay. <laughs> um, 
this is just a postcard from my tipping show last year. But a lot of times I will start with in the center with a circle and kind of work out. Okay. And then other times I, I, um, this is a, another postcard and you can see there's also the center, but this one isn't necessarily just constant circle. They have tendrils that go in and out and in and out. Um, but I have no real work except for this super tiny piece on the wall here. Oh, wow. That's so it's, cool. It's so really tiny, and it's from a couple years ago. Um, I remember during some show, it was a long time ago, and Jocelyn Matthews had said that she thought it would be really cool to have um, some of my work be really tiny. And I tr so I tried to do that. And I was like, oh, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> so that was what that piece was. Um, but anyway, yeah, uh, I usually do start with a circle and kind of work out from there and sometimes it will be more organic in that I don't have an, an idea in my head I usually will just I will pick out colors colors is usually what I start with is I find like a certain color palette that I that I want to work with and go from there and then other times I'll have a drawing that I want to try to figure out how to do because like unlike like painting or uh, any other types of assemblage type project, you can pretty much go, oh, I know exactly how to do this. But with um, doing continuous knotting, when you're, where you're basically starting from one point and you're working out and you're always um, working with that same, um, not the same Why? piece of the string. Yeah, yeah, it's like continuous. It's just right. continuous and when there are elements that I have to figure out, like, well, how am I going to make that happen that I see in my mind and work with reality what can actually be done in the framework of those that nodding technique? So that's usually what I spend a lot of my time doing is just trying to figure it out. Like, I'll lay in bed at night, and I'll, like, do the knots in my head, and I'll be going across oh, or going in a circle, no. and I'll be working it out. In my head, and I'll be like, oh, nope, that won't work. Back it up. That's oh, crazy. That <laughs> I think that's pretty. I mean, there might be other, I'm sure there's other artists that have ways to carry their work, but that sounds really unique to me. Have you always been able to do that? Like, to picture your, your work, like, when you're not in front of it? Um, yeah, yeah. It, uh, cool. My brain kind of, um, I don't know. I have a more three-dimensional brain, and it can sometimes be frustrating to not be able to actually be doing it to work it out. Right. But it's such a tremendously slow process that if I were to work everything out physically yeah. and it didn't work, I would have hours and hours invested and have to undo it, which is another several hours, or sometimes just ruins it because of the taking apart yeah. sometimes deteriorates the material. Um, so... So working through it in my head is something that I can do, but also had kind of have to do just yeah. to save myself a lot of time and frustration. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's really cool. I don't think that's something that a lot of people practice. So I think that's a really interesting approach because I know there's people where there'll be a life change and they're not able to be like in their studio as much. But even then, like with painting, I can paint over something. And it's not the same as it unraveling and like being like gone. So I think that's even more important for your process then to be able to do that. But yeah. well, how long have you been working with tapestries? And was that your first like 3D art experience? <laughs> or were there other 3D? Oh, no. Um, actually, I, I went to ETFU. Um, from 89 until 93, um, and a five-year sculpture program. So I was um, studying under Jack Schrader, who used to be over the art department, and I my major, my focus in art was welded metal sculpture. <laughs> so, so I feel like I've come like a full circle almost, but soft instead of hard right. and I, I do sometimes still work with metal like I have a, a piece right here that oh cool is I always considered this to be unfinished 
because I had this idea that I was going to weave all around in all these different spots. But the more it stays unfinished, the more I think it's finished. Yeah. <laughs> it's been years since I worked on that. This is all my other other artists work sitting around for inspiration and oh, support cool. and love. <laughs> I can recognize some of it. Yeah, I bet. That's so cool. <laughs> or a lot of it. I love, and your postcards, you're really good at really picky. I mean, your your work's very striking anyways, but I like your postcards are like some of my favorite ones to save because they're just like the color and the pattern and the way that they're cropped, they're just so memorable and they're, they have such a confidence like to them. I just love them so much. And I don't know if I ever told you about the first time I saw your work, but the first time was, wasn't until, well, I heard your name, but it was when you exhibited at uh, the Willow Tree at the um, bookstore where they have like an artist that would stay for like, I guess, was it like a couple of months at a time or? Yeah, it was for, yeah, that was in February of 2017. Okay. So that was like years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and I remember like Sid saw your work and he was like, you have to find out like who Laura Bowman is. Like you're gonna love her work. And when we saw it, we both. I mean, it, it, it had such a like a visceral feeling, like especially in person. But we both were thinking of like music videos that we love and how your work reminded me us of that. <laughs> like, um, like I don't know if people told you that. Like we we thought a lot of like Bjork. And like people who work with a lot of like three D, like super immersive, like theatrical, like I just have like such a like a, it just has such a bold feeling to me. So anyway, so but I remember seeing that, and you were just like, just like like I was nervous to approach you. So I'm so excited to talk to you because I mean we're friends now, but it's still like magical. So. I'm a 100 percent nerd, awkward person. Well, nerds are good, but. Are there like, do you have like influences that you think might surprise people or like, like, like a lot of times like an artist can look at a piece and they'll remember maybe the music they were listening to at the time or maybe even like a movie that they were into and like, do you have certain things you listen to or watch when you're making it or do you have nothing playing or what is that like for you? Okay, so I know back in like, because I've only been doing um, nodding textile type work for about, let's say, five or six years. Okay. And I know in the beginning, I listened to music constantly um, when I was working. And I do have like certain pieces that I know what I was listening to when I was working on it. But as time goes on, um, it, you know, the time spent working on the piece, it's like, I know I've listened to way more music or podcasts or anything than the thing I remember, but for some reason there will be just like one certain moment okay. that sticks in my mind. And I know that that's not the, what I listen to the whole time. It just happens to be the thing that my mind has connected to that piece. So I have that a lot. Um, I don't listen to music quite as much as I used to. I've gone through a weird, like not yeah. listening to music as I used to for the last five years or so, um, which is a whole other weird um, emotional thing. But um, I, I tend to listen to podcasts okay. and books on tape. You can I'm aging myself by saying books on tape. <laughs> no, I have tapes too. I love them. That's good. So I have, I have the, the audio books that you can get from the library, the little app, and yeah. it's free and it's the most amazing thing and so listening to books I've listened to so many books so many podcasts and sometimes if I'm just not feeling I'm just wanting a, a more I don't know more mindless entertainment I will sometimes get my phone and sit it and just have like a, a, a sitcom or something playing yeah. like friends or you know something yeah. like that that's so cool <laughs> I've actually heard that a lot lately with artists or even with people in general like having like a show playing like on their computer or on their phone just for like comfort and I think that's happening especially like now like if, if there's a period where you're not able to be around people or you need to zone out and relax like a lot of people do that to help with like sleeping or 
for different things. And like, that's something I haven't thought about till recently, but it seems really helpful. But I think well, that there's um there's something about giving your mind something to do for me anyway, because there's so much concentration in the work that I'm doing that it's almost like, um, like a very undisciplined meditation where I'm very focused, but at, but at the same time, there's a part of my brain that's just like spinning yeah. and I will start thinking about all the things and it will just, you know, it's really not always good. And so having something to listen to, yeah. it, it like, it directs my focus. So I have like the thing that I'm working on and the thing I'm listening to. And that keeps me sort of um, from letting my mind spin. And I will notice that there are times, especially if I'm stressed, that I will find that I I don't even know what I've just listened to because that part of my brain has like pushed to the front and said, no, we're going to stress and think about things, even though you're trying to block it. So that's when I know that like there's something I need to pay attention to and yeah. stop pushing down all the stuff that's swimming around in my head. So. I could see that. There's an artist I interviewed a long time ago. Um, she's a watercolor figurative painter named Fei Ku from Vietnam. And I remember her thing was to listen to uh, baseball games, like on NPR or something. And I was like, I was really young when I interviewed her. And I remember thinking like, that's so weird. Like why baseball? But then after graduating and not having the class environment of being around other people and like not talking to them, but still interacting in small ways and just having that where other people are working or their music is playing. Then I got it and I realized, like, cause I have to have something on too. And sometimes I don't know, or it doesn't matter as much. It's like, I, I'll go on YouTube and it's like makeup tutorials and I'm not watching it because I'm painting, but it's so soothing and cool and relaxing. So I think, I think that makes total sense. <laughs> but that's so cool. What are your favorite, if you don't mind sharing some of your favorite podcasts lately? Or what's the last book that you finished that you've listened? Um, I'm li- I, I just actually started listening to a book. I haven't listened to a book in a really long time. I was really distracted with needing short attention span things. Um, I just started listening to the most recent Ann Tyler book. I, I can't remember the name of it. Re- the Redhead by the Side of the Road or something okay. like that. And I really love Ann Tyler's work. And it's really different than what I'm usually drawn to in that it's just normal (laughs) it's just normal stories of people's lives and um i think there's a lot of escapism in some of her older stuff especially for women or mothers they're usually like stories where they end up walking away from their lives or whatever um but uh i'm I'm generally tend to be more drawn towards like sci-fi okay cool Uh, (laughs) i like sci-fi books too that's so cool opal's middle name is june so i'm like super into stuff like yeah cool but i i'm trying to think of a podcast that i've listened to recently um oh um spooked okay i I I listened to all of the spooked episodes that were on on spotify (laughs) it's like it's it's um, you know how there's a there's a podcast called Creepy, which is basically they they're they're reading these stories off of the creep, creepy pasta um, on Reddit, and um, but Spooked is more people actually telling their stories, and it's not made up. It's not made up stuff. It's like right. these things that people actually experience. So it's like it's really it's really well done, and the yeah. um, the host is pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, another podcast that I really really love is Lavar Burton Reed. I keep, I need to listen to that. My husband listens to it and loves it. And like, I love LeVar Burton. I used to play him when I taught in a real, like a physical classroom. Cause I just do online tutoring and I would play snippets of Reading Rainbow. And he's just, he's so cool and he's so sweet. But what is his podcast like? He's, he's basically picked short stories and, that he loves and reads them. And I have found several authors that I've fallen in love with through just listening to his podcast, N.K. Jemison, and just, um, 
I don't know, he's so soothing. He does this thing in the very beginning where he talks to you in his LeVar Burton voice, you know, and it's yeah. very soothing. And then he says, now let's take a deep breath. That's so cool. And let's begin. And, it's, and I take that deep breath with him every time. It's just like, That's so, a good idea. Pretty. <laughs> yeah, there was, like, I, I had forgotten, like, on Reading Rainbow, they had a segment, like, where you would watch something being made in a factory, and, like, I remember as a kid, I, I feel like I spent so much time watching, like, how pencils are made or paper, and it was so cool, and I yeah. had this class of fifth graders that, like, all the teachers hated, and they're like, are you gonna be okay, like, you have Miss Osborne's class today, like, like, we're going to pray. They were, like, freaking out like, because I was, like, a new teacher. And it was the end of the class, and I played Reading Rainbow. Like, and it was the, the factory part, and they were showing how bowling balls were being made. And it was oh. so dated. And it was from, like, super early 80s. And every kid was so interested, and they were so excited. And it was, like, super simple. But... There's something about him and how you can tell is how kind he is and just the pace of it. And it was, mm -hmm. feels like so welcoming. So I love him. So, but they loved it. And then like the teacher came to pick them up and they were just like, what did you do? Like, why are they all like, it was like they had yoga class or something. So <laughs> it was so cool. <laughs> but that's so cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and mention to anyone watching, I think there's quite a few viewers. Um, if anyone has a question for Laura, please ask. Um, I wanted to ask you about your 2D work and how that factors into your art practice. Because I know for me, um, I'm terrified of 3D and I attempt it and work on it sometimes. But I feel like you work with both pretty uh, prolifically and I might be wrong. But how does painting and drawing come into your practice? And how important is it for you to do that? Or is it more of like a side project for you? It's, it's more of a side project, more um, just another way to play with color that is more satisfying in a way that I can see results quicker. <laughs> um, with, the, with the fiber art, because of it taking months and months to do, I get really impatient not really patient and I want to see like um like if I'm using a variegated yarn I want to see like how that's going to come out once it yeah. works through the knots and which colors are going to show and how that's good that's my thing I get really excited about but um, I love variegated colors too <laughs> fun and so drawing and painting and things like that is more of just like um I, I guess it's just it's just what art is. It's just another way to express a desire for um, visually stimulating imagery. Yeah, and <laughs> um, more, it can be more instantaneous, like you're saying. Like if you want to sketch something or just like put color down really fast. You can do it mm -hmm. if you can do that, and it's really easy to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is a painting that I did. Oh, gosh, oh, it was cool. probably, I don't know, 2009. <laughs> it's really old, but it's one of my favorite. And whenever I've done like a trying to get rid of art sale thing, I'm always really glad that no one has bought that. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, selling work is a, a really weird thing. I think it's super weird. To get out. What is what have been the different ways that you've sold work? Well, I know you, cause I'm sure you sell work in person, but what has it been like to sell like digitally? Like, has it been like where you've tried different things, or have there been things that work? I, I haven't really like. I used to do. Everyone corrects me on this, but I'm I've been saying it this way for so long. I used to have EP. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I used to post stuff on there a long time ago, like 2004 or five. And I just, I didn't find it to be a very satisfying thing for me because it pulled me in the direction of trying to be productive, like 
what is sellable? Yeah. What can I make that I can make really fast and be really, you know, sellable? Like I was doing knotted jewelry and different things like that. And I tried to do that a couple of years ago too. And it was such a distraction yeah. from what I really wanted to do. And I had to stop thinking about um, making work in order to sell it. And what I really wanted to do was make work to show in galleries. Yeah. And once I figured out that that was what I really, really wanted to do, I feel like my work really was able to grow and became much more mature and less rushed. And um, so I can't remember what your question was. Oh, so, no, that so, um, yeah, I, I had like the piece that was on my postcard for my show, the red and green piece mm -hmm. that was actually sold to someone who followed me on Instagram. Okay. And um, she said she wanted to buy it before it was even finished. And that made me really, really anxious <laughs> because yeah. I was like, oh, God, what if it doesn't turn out like how she's expecting That would it? be really yeah. interesting. I've never had that before. So it sounds me neither. <laughs> and stressful at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And so I was able to keep it um, for my show last year. And then once my show came down, then I sent it to her and it was like, bye. <laughs> and um, another one of my very favorite pieces um, was bought by a friend of mine who also owns another one of my pieces that I borrowed for my show that that just got right now that I can't see. Um, she bought that piece uh, at the beginning of the year when, you know, we were going through a lot of craziness in January and I needed extra money and I was trying to sell things. And so I bought this one piece and I cried about it because I was really happy that it was going to somebody that I knew for one thing, but I felt like I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like, I didn't want anybody else to have it. And it's such a, it was so personal. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, it literally is one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. Um, and the piece that, that I just finished that was sort of like the unveiling, um, at Dos Gatos, um, uh, I had just finished it, you know, that day yeah. and then hung it and that my hanging of it was not great because I had just done it really quickly. And so when we came in to get ready for the show that night for the reception, it had fallen, it had fallen <laughs> and I had to, I had to put it back up and fix it. And then I, yeah. but like, that's the most like contact that I've had with it. And I haven't seen it since yeah. then. And it's like in this locked up place and um, no one else can see it either. So right. right now it's like having a show up right now. And I know that there's a lot of artists who are preparing for shows. My friend Ruby, you know, she's yeah. preparing for a show and putting a lot of work in and they never even got to hang those shows. Right. And I was so excited to have my work at those office because you know, there's all this traffic and, you know, yeah. people coming and going, whereas in a gallery, it, it's not quite as much foot traffic. Right. And I and I was so excited. And then within, oh gosh, like a week, it was starting to become really clear that no one was going to be able to see my work. Right. And um, with everything being shut down. And uh, Kate and I have kind of briefly in comments on Facebook talked about me going over there sometime when I can just be by myself and go through and do like a live show, like a live Facebook yeah. stream. So I can like talk about each piece and, it, and that would be really cool to do. And I'm, I'm thinking that if I decide to leave the house for anything besides groceries, I might do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I saw Kate do that with like her personal collection. And I thought that was cool because yeah. your work, I went to Dos Gatos, I wouldn't say just like, it was just a couple of days before they closed. And I remember like, it just felt weird because there were not many people and it was that in limbo where it was like we were all staying home but i went out to meet a friend and we were talking like should we even be here and i remember sitting next to one of your pieces and just thinking like like so many people like since then in just a couple of weeks everyone has had all of their shows either not happen or become canceled but it has mm -hmm. to be more surreal for you to have had a show and now it's even more in limbo because it's there but it's not being experienced and that just seems so like it's like more like a dystopian thing with what's happening like it's really bizarre yeah. 
Have you seen the picture that they posted? It's kind of like from the hall. It's like everything's empty. Yes. And the walls, you can kind of see my work. Like, I'm probably yeah. the only one that knows that it's my work. Because yeah, it's kind no, of I think other people would. But that picture, like, took my breath away in that I have tons of dystopian fantasies as a lot of sci-fi nerds kind of, yeah. you know, I, I have, like, I, I love the idea of end times and how would we survive as a society? How would we come back? And I think about all of the movies and things like that where you go into, they go into, like, an old library or an old museum, and there's all this work on the walls. You know, that hasn't been like, for some reason, hasn't been looted yet. But, you know, it's there. Right. And that was that feeling it gave me when I saw that picture. It was like, yeah, it made this situation come like really alive for me. Yeah. Because being at home all the time is my norm. Like what's happening inside my house and how I live every single day has not changed at all. And I mean, obviously there's ways that it has changed, but like that daily routine, I'm not, I'm not necessarily feeling stir crazy because, you know, this is what I'm used to. And, but then this picture of the outside world and my work there and no people and knowing that it's shut down, it just gave me this chilling, eerie feeling of like, oh my gosh, this is, this is happening. Yeah. And it's, it's so surreal when it's a place that's such a warm and like inviting place like it's there's so many places like that like with willow tree and descados where it's like they're so welcoming and to have them like temporarily not exist basically or be put on pause is so surreal because it's not something that anybody saw at least not like six months ago maybe three months ago but even then we we didn't know what was going to happen so it, it feels like a very like shocking thing and I I spent uh, I have been spending a lot more time at home because of having an uh, opal, but like we'll go outside and there's like a kid riding their bike with like a mask on and I'm like, oh my I'm like yeah like this is happening and you see people with mat and it's good it's a good thing it's because like it's it's good that places are closing before there's any mandate or there's people taking precaution but it's also okay. super sad that we have to do that. And it's like, it, there's such a, like a sadness with it too. So it's really interesting, yeah. like the mix of like protecting each other by having to not see each other and it, having so much taken away at once. It's just, it's so weird. It's so crazy yeah. to me, but yeah. And I, I like seeing some of the art that's coming out of that. Yeah. Like Becca has posted a really yeah, mask. really beautiful. Um, and just, just, even though my work isn't representational, um, I feel like there's there it will inevitably have an impact on what I'm doing right now. Besides making little turtles, yeah. <laughs> um, but now that I've I, I've kind of worked through a little, I had like a block with this piece, and I wasn't really wanting to work on it. Plus, I wasn't making myself work on it because I had been really tired of having a deadline. So that I was blocked with it and now that I'm not blocked with it and all of this going on like with each piece that I make because it spans so much time there's all these different life events that usually like I don't know they're like embedded in those pieces and that usually is why I tend to sort of retroactively name and give significance to a piece whether it's you know, just for myself not it's not anything that anybody would know but usually i will have that in hindsight mm-hmm. looking back over like what i was doing and how um it might have affected the direction that it took right. the mood that i was in you know what's going on so i'm just kind of curious if that will have an impact on my original idea and if it will if it will somehow change because I'm always right. open to that so I don't know but I do like seeing that there are artists who are expressing you know you. what's going on and that will have that to look back on Me as too. our history that's it's, this is a significant point in our history and none of us have ever lived through a pandemic yeah. we've never lived through anything so huge and I I 
if there's this part of me that feels like it's going to be really significant historically um, with art and just, you know, society, culture, all of these different things, but then there's this other part of me that feels like everything will just go back to normal. Yeah, you know, I've wondered every- about that too. I hope that doesn't happen, but I feel like we're so attached to um, our comforts and all of these things that it would be kind of nice to not go back to that and really yeah. truly have a true revolution, a true upheaval. But at the same time, that comes at the cost of so many lives yeah. and um, businesses and families. It's just it's like it's a weird there is... Mix. There's no easy revolution. There's no there's no revolution without pain and suffering. And yeah. it's like you don't want that. It's like you know that 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 fantasy of getting past the the end of end of the world dystopia and everything has to rebuild and and then getting to that place where you know everything has been rebuilt and society is different and we treat each other differently and maybe you know money is different because you know you see people bartering more now right. and you know what what can come out of that but i feel like it's going to take so much more than this which sounds yeah. like a bizarre thing to say considering how big this is to say that that it's going to take more than this to right. make but i agree change. i feel like there there are so many people that are eager like even now there are people that are eager to still reject what's happening. And I think for all of us, of course it's surreal. And like for me, like it's like I'll wake up and I'll remind myself, I'm like, oh yeah, this is happening. And it's so, it's still so strange to me, but like there are people who still aren't taking the necessary precautions, I feel like. And so knowing that, and then knowing that like some people, when they were starting to lift some of the restrictions in China, There are some places like movie theaters and these places that are important but not necessary right now that were getting filled up already. And I'm like, is that what's going to happen if we're able to have time to go back to having things open? Like, is it going to be packed because people are so eager to like jump back into normal life and to like push it aside? Because I think I'm with you. There needs to be a lot of reflection and I think there are going to be lots of people that reflect too but it'll be interesting to see how that balances out because there's like two different groups of people I feel like where there's people that are more um just kind of realizing the gravity and more people who are in denial and and I feel like it's, it's it's shocking to me that there are people still in denial or even like even on Facebook there's a friend who I always like revered, who is falling into the conspiracy theory, which is a whole different thing, but they don't believe that this is an actual thing happening. And I'm like, and like, you don't have to even say anything. There's always medical, like nurses and people that are just like, do you want to come to work with me? Like, do you want to see what's happening? And so knowing that that's a possibility and to know someone that thinks like that blows my mind. So I'm curious too, because we don't know what the impact will be because people can be so unpredictable i feel like but i think it, i mean it'll impact us no matter what in yeah. some way but i think with art and like anything that has to do with communication that's going to be so much more visible because even like i'm not i'm not directly dealing with it but i love seeing people like becca work on these incredible drawings and like reflect it and i think no matter what people are going to be like, like for me like my palette's gotten like a lot darker and I've like there's like things that are just like small but it, there's still like a shift and I feel like everyone's going to have something affected where they're going to do something different because of this happening but I guess we'll just have to wait and see though too yeah yeah so, mm-hmm. interesting how are so your kids I know you have at least two that live here do you have one yeah. that still lives in Nashville or are they all kind of spread out or how has it been for like family and like trying to stay connected and communicating for you? Um, Samuel is in Nashville and uh, Sadie and Silas are here in, are in Johnson City and they are just 
in their own little world. <laughs> just like we are here. We're just, yeah. you know, in our bubbles. And um, for my birthday, which was on the 27th of March, it was the first year of like not having my kids around yeah. me. And we, and we did a group chat, a group, group video chat. And that was really cool. And I kind of hope we'll do that again. Yeah. And, um, and, as, and um, as far as like my, my family, like my parents and my sisters, we've done the same thing, a video chat. Um, so yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I have to mention, I think I've told you before, but Strummer's a huge fan of Samuel and has his cassette tapes. And then um, Strummer has a best friend. I don't know, do you know the McClelland family? Like Logan and Dave McClelland. And they've got three super creative kids. Um, but their third kid, their youngest, is Strummer's bestie, like best friend. And they both love cassette tapes. So Samuel is like an idol, like at least oh. a drummer. <laughs> because oh, like yeah. now, and the like, he's, he's just six, but like he'll close his door and he's just like, I need to listen to music. And he's like trying to sing along to like Aki and stuff. And he's like, it's so, he takes it so seriously. And I'm like, you're like a teenager already. <laughs> But if for some reason, there's something about Aki that, like, speaks to him. So, I, I don't think I've told Samuel before, so I need to tell him. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when you, like, I think you had done a story or something. Yeah. And, and I remember seeing that, and I, I did a little thing where I did, like, did a record, you oh, know, where cool. you can do, like, a screen record. I was like, this is the coolest thing. And I yes. said, about it. Cool. Because <laughs> he, he has a little, it's, a, it's like an old tape player it doesn't even have a CD player. It's just tape and radio that used to be mine, and now it's his. But that's his number one favorite. And, like, we have other cassette tapes, but they don't matter. <laughs> but that's cool. Well, I'm trying to think. I had some other questions that I thought of. And let me go ahead and see this, if anyone has sent some questions. There's a little question mark. I get a lot of, like people writing comments too so i've had some people say beautiful work let's see i love the detail because i agree i love the detail too um cool. is there anything that you want to share about maybe just the process that you feel like people don't know about that you haven't shared before or just any kind of like are there any like, approaches or how about um what are some like references that you use that you don't think other people would know in terms of how you choose color or just how you choose pattern? Like, is it anything from like nature to like other stuff or like, is it too broad to really explain? I think I do it. I don't like do any kind of color theory or anything like that. I don't even really remember what that means. <laughs> it's been so yeah. long. I basically, I basically just like go to my oh, my wow. mask oh, that's cool to see. and I like look and I'll have like certain colors and usually what I'll do is I, I know that I always want to work with like something that's variegated and um, if there's one that I can I'm like oh yeah I really want this to be like my main like color then I will work from that and find colors that I want to, to go with. Oh, it's breaking up a little bit. Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, no. It's yeah, probably because I have to sit down. Um, but I don't have anything that I, like, I look at, like, uh, to inspire anything. Um, yeah. It's all just... That's <laughs> even better. I feel like it's even better, though, because, like, I know, like, from, like, a painting standpoint, well, and let me ask you first, when you were in, uh, when you were in art school, what were some like classes that you took that you thought maybe weren't going to be important to you and maybe surprised you as far as like learning a new technique or this like something a teacher said to you? Because I know for me, there were classes that I was like, why do I have to take this? And then later I ended up using that, like the stuff I learned for a long time. But is there anything like, like printmaking or painting or something where you learned the technique that really helped you? Or even just a cool teacher. Well, I had I had several cool teachers. Um, I think that uh, 
I would say basic design probably. Okay. Um, just some of the, the projects, you know, just pen and ink. I don't know why people say that. Why do people say pen and ink? I, I don't forget. know. It's, I guess they used to use like the nibs or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is though. I never used that. <laughs> but um, like just design, design work that's just basic, and um, and then like basic design was black and white, and then design basic design. The second one is color. And a weird thing happened when I registered. I ended up taking the the second part first and the first part second. And didn't I don't think it really made a difference, but yeah. I don't know, maybe it did. Maybe it made color yeah. seem like the more important thing. <laughs> like some color first. Um, but I do remember something that Schrader, Jack Schrader said that to me and my friend um, Nikki, who was also a sculpture major. He had said something to us one time that if we weren't spending hours in the library studying other artists, that we weren't real artists. And I was like, what? Oh, no. <laughs> what? And, like, that's the last thing that an artist needs to hear is that they're not a real artist. And that really stuck with me. And I think that I, I don't know, I kind of fought against that. I fought against a lot of stuff he said. I did even though he was a huge mentor. Like he had said one time that my work was very decorative and I had tried really hard for it to not be decorative. I wanted it to be Aww. edgy and cool and, you know, metal. Yeah. <laughs> but, but ended up being decorative. I don't know why. But just because of the design elements that, you know, you take these big chunks of metal and you weld them together in a certain way and, Put it, and I, I really want. It. I like doing freestanding sculpture, but I also like doing wall pieces. And I do sometimes think about certain pieces then and how they relate to what I do now because I did use a lot of circles. So I don't know. Yeah, I think it was interesting. a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know for me, like I loved art school, like overall. But the stuff I remember the most. And I hate this. It's always like the people that said something that was like really snarky or it's things like made me feel like what? And like that stands out. Like and it, and it only came from grad student teachers. Did you have teachers that were grad students? And like, okay, for some reason, and like no, no shade to grad students. I like, I went to grad school, but I was told as an undergrad by a grad student, they're like, you'll never make it in grad school. And another one was like, your art, like, what was it? There, there's a piece I made, a collage, and, like, this grad student was like, who made this? This is so striking, so breathtaking. And I raised my hand, and he goes, no, there's no way it was you. And he was like, I can't. But it was so dramatic. It, in hindsight, I, I didn't take it personally over time because I'm like, why did he have to yell no to everybody? <laughs> But there are things that happen where people say things like that, like you're not a real artist or one told me if you don't practice, like if you don't paint nine to 12 hours a day, like don't be a painter. And I'm like, sometimes I paint like 10 minutes and that's all I can do. And I'm totally a painter. Like it doesn't matter. But I think like what you said, like there, it's nice to have things that you work against sometimes because there's so many different ways to be an artist. And when people say stuff like that, I'm like, okay, like, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> but it's interesting. But it, for me, it stands out the most. So I don't know. Yeah. It's an experience for sure. <laughs> I think they just were, were naturally geared to go against the stream. Yeah. Just like anything, anything that pushes against us, we want to push back and yeah. it just like makes us stronger. And I see. Yeah, and I feel like with your work, like it's interesting to hear about your metal work and to hear that you work with metal because I feel like with your tapestries, like I've seen other tapestries, like by just by different kinds of artists and from different places. And like um, there's a museum in Iceland that I lived close to for a long time that's a fiber museum. So there are tons of different tapestry artists. But even then, like, your work is so different from anyone else's that I've seen. So I think that, like, subversive nature or, like, making something that's more, like, unique and strike Because there's, like, they feel so lively. Like, they're, like, these invented creatures almost. 
but there's there's more to it than that even so i feel like that comes through and so i it's it would be interesting to see like more of your metal pieces from the past because i bet there's a lot of overlay or maybe even if it's not visible maybe there's things that you did back then that i'm sure like appear with what you make now but do you think there's any like, similarities with your metal work from back then or what do you think I I think that there are some things that show through in my my designs, my water you know, watercolor, uh, my drawings, paintings, my old sculptures, and even the new sculptures that I've done in the last few years. I do think that there is an element to all of them that is consistent, which is line. And yeah. um, and I and I've talked about it before in some of my um, my like artist statements. Um, about line like even when I was doing three-dimensional big metal work I whenever we'd go to the junkyard I would always find like the, these thin metal rods and I would love it if there was like a lot of them you know a lot of one one similar element and bring those back to the you know to the welding and and, and just like create these huge three-dimensional things out of these really thin metal rods and so I feel like that's still something that I do. Uh, even when I do sculptures that I put leading on top of, there's always just these lines. And I guess that's why I'm drawn towards, I was drawn towards leading in the beginning just because you know, you've got the warp and the weft. It's just lines. You're basically taking just lines and making something significant and solid out of just lines. And that appeals to me a great deal. And so I think that's the element that probably is always going to yeah. be there and there's there's a lot of like construction to your work not just because of it being weaving but just the fact that you have so many organic shapes and things that happen that to me feel very unexpected and unique because i'm not used to seeing tapestries that turn into set sculptural works like that and so i feel like that that definitely explains like the fact that you have a sculpture background and you're used to working with things that are like super I mean, to me metal seems really intimidating but it seems like your work has such a confidence about it like there's just such like a strong like entity like, or presence i guess and so it's interesting to think of that and to realize like what kind of mediums you've handled and how that's influenced it but Cause they definitely feel like these really cool creatures or something. I don't know if other people or what are some things that you've heard from people as far as like their impressions of your work or what have they told you? Um, creatures, okay. <laughs> um, aliens. Sometimes it's just like, um, fl sometimes it'll be like flowers, some sort of weird alien flower. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's usually in that that genre um the last few i guess maybe not as much but some of the other pieces and that that are a little more like bug like yeah. <laughs> because of the tendrils that i like to do they're very they, they like legs <laughs> um yeah. and i don't usually do symmetrical but i had done the one really symmetrical piece that's one of my favorites that i got a lot of like mask um bugs aliens and uh one of my friends said um it was karen said that it was he saw a figure in it oh wow and i that's loved cool. that i was like yay yeah <laughs> that's something different but when i can and i think again like like i always think of like like music videos with your work because i feel there's so much of a presence or so much movement to them, especially where there are tendrils and these shapes that really